wonderful. She is the Gordon McKay uh, Professor of Computer Science at Harvard University and the Radcliffe Alumni Professor um, she has won many awards, and she is most well known for as really one of the inventors of differential privacy. She works now on lots of issues in differential privacy and a lot on fairness, and um, I think we're delighted to have her speak today. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction and for inviting me here. Um, pleasure to be here. So this is a talk about fairness in algorithms. And um, it's a project that I embarked on in about, I guess I started in the summer of 2010. And it was clear that algorithms were going to be reaching deeper and deeper into our lives and that fairness was going to be some kind of an issue. But you have to think, how do you wrap your head around this and how do you find a starting point to see whether math and theoretical computer science can contribute to this question of having fairness in algorithms. So basically, we took a page from the, um, um, the paradigm that developed in cryptography in the 80s. And we sat down and we said, well, we don't really know what fairness is, but what are some of the things that we're trying to prevent? What would be, you know, what would be the goals of a bad guy in fairness and classification. So somebody who wants to be unfair. And um, uh, we took as our starting point this uh, online advertising. So we imagined that we worked for a company that had an advertising platform and, and the company maybe wants to make sure that, the, that advertising is done in a fair way and it interacts with vendors or advertisers who are unknown, untrusted, you can't vet them, decisions have to be made really, really fast. So how do you, um, how do you, how do you get fairness in such a situation? So we started to think of what would a deliberately unfair advertiser be looking for, be trying to do? And we built a catalog of evils. So we said, um, the idea being, if we, could, if we could find a method of protecting against these evils, there might be other bad things that could happen, in which case, in the future, you might want to um, uh, require a stronger system. But in the meantime, we have still prevented these evils. So um, some of the things that, that uh, come up are things like redlining. So are you familiar with redlining from the housing market? It's illegal to discriminate based on race, but what about based on zip code? And there was literally a map with certain <coughs> zip codes that were considered undesirable for giving loans, and that was strongly correlated with race. So it seemed to skirt the law, but it was, yeah, okay. Um, and what's going on, if you think about it, in, in this zip code question, is that, um, Sensitive information may be embedded holographically in your data. But you can't just say we'll avoid being unfair by not allowing the uh, algorithm to access a certain attribute because there may be other um, echoes of this attribute elsewhere in the data. So race is echoed in the zip code. Um, so that's called exploiting redundant encodings. We also had various other things, including uh, one that I'll highlight here, which is deliberately targeting the wrong subset of your minority group. So suppose you had some notion that you have to send an ad equally to people of different races, but for some race you only send the ad to people who can't afford the service. Then you send the ad equally, but what you're doing is clearly not fair in some sense. Okay. So that does bring us to statistical parity, which is um, many people's sort of first go-to notion of what fairness might mean. So we imagine that we have people and we are mapping them to classification outcomes. The classifier might be determining, for example, whether you should get a loan or not, or perhaps uh, what kind of terms you should get for your credit card. So um, what statistical parity says is well, that the demographics of the group that you select for your university, for your loans, and so on, should be the same as the demographics of the underlying population. And what that says, um, more formally, is that the probability 
given that you have been mapped to a certain outcome O, that you're a member of S, it's the same as the probability that if we draw from the population as a whole, you'll get a member of S. And in this case, this turns out to be equivalent to saying that the probability that you're mapped to a particular outcome is independent of whether you're in a minority group S or in the complement of S. So this does completely neutralize redundant encodings, but as I mentioned on the previous slide, it still permits some of the evils in the catalog, such as intentionally targeting the subset of S that is unable to buy. Now, there are a lot of other notions of group fairness that have been appearing in the literature lately. So, in particular, in the context of recidivism prediction, there's been this question of, do you want to insist on the equal false positive rates between different groups? Um, or equal false negative rates across groups? Or perhaps if you're trying to predict whether somebody is at high risk for recidivating, you might want that you would have equal positive predictive value, which is what's the probability that you recidivate given that the, the classifier says you will. Um, uh, or rather, among those who are classified as high risk, what fraction of them recidivate. Or you might want equal false discovery rates across groups. So all of these are very natural things to, uh, to find desirable in a classifier. And they're very problematic as a group or as a whole because uh, results of Chulduchova and uh, separately related results of Kleinberg, Malaynathan, and Raghavan show that if you have a classifier that is imperfect, that is, it will make some errors, no imperfect classifier can simultaneously ensure equal false positive rates, false negative rates, and positive predictive value across groups. So this really was uh, interesting in the context of the COMPASS uh, recidivism production, uh, prediction system, where ProPublica sort of came out and said, this algorithm is racist because it gives um, uh, an uh, un unfairly high or a higher false positive rates for blacks than for whites, a higher false negative rates for whites than for blacks, and so it's unfair. And the company responded essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, by saying, but our results are test fair. The positive predictive value is the same across these groups. In other words, when you see a positive prediction, it has exactly the same meaning whether the individual is black or is white. So we are fair. So how do you, you know, what's the resolution of this? The re resolution of this is the simple equation in Chulachova's paper, which relates the false positive rates to the positive predictive values and the false negative rates. And this term is a term the, the quantity P is the base rate of recidivating across, uh, in, in the population. So if the base rates are different and you require equal false positive rates, false, neg uh, false negative rates, and positive predictive value, you're, you're in trouble. You can't get it. Okay. Now, a different approach to fairness um, uh, which we espoused early on, is what we call individual fairness. So this captures the uh, intuition that for a particular, for any given classification task, there is some notion of how similar or dissimilar people are for that particular classification task. So everybody in this room might be fairly similar in terms of reading recommendations on technical subjects, but maybe very, very dissimilar when it comes to recommending hair products. So um, the idea in individual fairness says, people who are similar with respect to a specific classification task should be classified similarly. So it introduces the notion of a task-specific metric, which takes pairs of individuals and gives a real number. And again, so that, that's going to be our notion of what it means to be similar. And again, similar people should be treated similarly. So it can be, um, right, so, so, uh, 
One of the examples that kind of motivated our thinking along these lines was um, the question of bright students. So suppose you have a minority group in which the bright students are steered by their parents and culture to study math and science. And you have a majority group in which the bright students are steered toward, say, finance. And you wanted to write a quick and dirty classifier for finding bright students for the purposes of, I don't know, some sort of summer camp or enrichment program. So because the majority is the majority, it might make sense just to write a classifier that looks for students who are studying finance. Because in some sense, it's going to be right on the majority, and the majority is very much the majority, so it doesn't make a whole lot of errors. So it makes some sense, but it lacks the sort of cultural awareness that for the purpose of finding bright students, being a member of a minority group and studying math should be viewed as similar to being a member of the majority group and studying finance. That we're looking for bright students. So we advocated a, a, that, the, that the metric would have to be culturally aware and that hiding sensitive attributes from the classification algorithm could be detrimental because it would prevent making this kind of adjustment. So we turned the approach fairness through awareness, both because the metric has to be culturally aware and because the algorithms should be aware as well. Now, there is always the question of hard thresholds. So think about credit scores for a minute. Imagine that the credit scores are sort of smushed uniformly from, what is it, a high of 800 down to whatever. And um, by smushed uniformly, I mean that for any two credit scores, no matter how close they are, there are really a lot of people at these different scores. So if you figure that you're looking at loan, uh, giving the loan and you're going to have a threshold that says people above this line should get the loan and people below should not because you have to draw the line somewhere, you have a problem. You have two very similar people who are classified differently. And um, so theoretical computer science, of course, this is a complete no-brainer. We say randomize. So instead of having deterministic algorithms, classifiers that deterministically map individuals to outcomes, they'll, they'll flip some coins. And um, the, so our, our classification algorithms will take individuals and map them to probability distributions on the outcomes. And then ensuring that similar are treated similarly is pretty easy. We require that the difference under some suitable difference in probability distributions, uh, the distribution assigned to an individual u and the distribution assigned to individual v should be bounded by the distance in our task-specific similarity metric between u and v. Is there a question on the definition? So the problem, of course, is that these metrics are, are, are science fiction. Where are we going to get hold of them? And we don't have a really good answer to that. We know that in some cases, metrics have been defined. For example, credit scores induce a metric. But, um, but in general, we don't know where to get them. And even if we did have a way of starting, ideally, uh, we would like these to be ground truth. But in reality, it's going to be no better than whatever society's best approximation is going to be. So we advocate having the metrics be public and subject to debate and, and argument and revision. But we're advocating sunshine for the metric. And of course, the major open question is, how can we learn the metric? And moreover, I conjecture that that the notion of a metric is actually unavoidable. We'll get to a little bit more about this later, but my feeling is that if you have a system that people believe is fair, <coughs> then you can, you can um, play with this thing and literally extract from it 
some approximation to the metric. Okay. So, I want to have a brief detour for a defense of the idea of individual fairness. And um, one of my favorite stories that I heard over the last year or so is the cucumbers and grape stories with capuchin monkeys. So and it's, this is called the unfairness experiment. Capuchin monkeys were paired up, and the monkeys were given tasks to do, and they did their tasks, and they were rewarded with cucumber slices, which they were perfectly happy with. But every now and then, in each pair, there would be one monkey that was sort of the chosen monkey. And every now and then, the chosen monkey would receive a grape instead of a cucumber slice. And occasionally, the chosen monkey would even get a grape without doing a task. What was the reaction of the unchosen monkey? They were really upset. They actually continued to do their tasks, but they would do things like throw the cucumber slices on the floor. <laughs> so they, they were rejecting, they were protesting the cucumber slices. And the point here is that there is no standard that says the correct reward for the task is a cucumber slice, or the correct reward is a grape. What mattered here wasn't justice, it was fairness. It was the difference between how similar were being treated for similar tasks. So um, this also comes up mathematically. You can have multiple classifiers. You know perfectly well that classifiers won't be right all the time, and your different classifiers can be making mistakes on different parts of the space, or making you know, errors on different parts of the space, but it still makes sense to talk about similar being treated similarly. OK. Um, so let's assume for a moment that we actually are able to ensure that similar people are treated similarly with this definition that I've been giving you. The next question that you always need to ask is, well, what happens under composition? People aren't classified just once. They're classified many times. Simple, simple case is um, uh, you have two students, let's say, you know, slightly differently uh, uh, qualified for school, one you know, a bit better than the other. And when students apply to college, they don't apply to one college, they apply to a number of colleges. And of course, all they need is to get accepted to one college, truly. So you could look at what we're calling or fairness. And you can do this with other kinds of um, uh, functions, not just or. So if you have um, the classifier for the same task or two different tasks, you might want to know if they're each individually fair, what about the or? And you can imagine that, assuming that nobody has probability zero of getting into college, if you were to apply to enough colleges, the probabilities both converge to one. But they diverge before they converge. And they diverge in a really realistic place, like at two, three, four uh, um, applications. So he, um, here's an example. Um, this is the probability for U of getting a positive. This is the probability for V. And this would be the curve if they stayed the same. And this is the OR. So, um, so you have to pay attention when you think about this uh, functional composition. And, you, and, and this raises the question of, well, who pays this attention? Where does it happen? How do we compensate for this unfairness? And these aren't things that you necessarily directly answer with the math. You have to keep the context in mind. Um, so the next example um, was inspired by a phenomenon that was observed by Data, Data, and Chance. So what did they do? Data, Data, and Chance um, uh, created a large number of fictitious individuals um, by creating Google profiles for them. And these individuals were absolutely identical, except half of them were fictitious male and half of them were fictitious female. So they just clicked different boxes. Okay. And these um, 
sorry. Okay, then each of the fictitious entities followed a script in which they visited a number of employment related websites. And at the end, they visited the Times of India where they received advertisements. And in the experiment, the advertisements that were received were recorded and a comparison was made between the advertisements shown to the fictitious men and the fictitious women. So remember, the profiles were identical and the scripts they followed were identical, so their histories were identical. The only difference was some were fictitious male and some were fictitious female. And Data, Data, and Chance uh, argued that they saw a major disparity between the ads shown to the fictitious females and the fictitious males. And um, in particular, there was a job coaching service that seemed to be advertising preferentially for men. Job, uh, job coaching for jobs that should earn you more than, I forget whether it was 200K or 400K a year. All right. So the initial reaction to this especially by Dante Dante and Schatz, was where did the blame lie? Was the blame in the um, uh, click prediction algorithm that Google had, which would, was predicting that men would be more likely to click on the job coaching service than women? Or was the advertiser advertising preferentially to men and, and bidding more for men than for women? But there was another possibility which um, is described here. Another possibility is maybe the job-related advertiser is willing to pay the same amount to, uh, to show the ad to men and to women. And there's some other advertiser out there, perhaps an appliance advertiser, that wants to pay a lot more to women, to show an ad to women, than to show it to men. And uh, according to Landa Schiebinger, an expert on gender um, uh, uh, discrimination at Stanford, um, uh, the attention of women is more highly sought on the web because women tend to be the purchasers for the entire family. They make the purchase decisions for the whole family. So in this scenario, it's perfectly reasonable for the appliance advertiser to want to pay more for women than for men. And if you don't like that example, substitute in a public service announcement for a disease outbreak that is affecting women. And it makes a lot of sense to pay a lot to get the women's attention. Okay. But this is, this is the current reality. Um, and so, so what happens is, what does the ad network do? When there is a place for a single banner ad and you've got this appliance person who's bidding a lot of money to show the ad to women and the job coaching service is offering a small amount of money to show an ad to women, the ad network will show the appliance ad to women and will fill in the blanks uh, with men by showing them the job related ad. So. This turns out to be completely inherent. And it's a kind of composition that, that we haven't really encountered before. So the study of the behavior of cryptographic primitives and privacy primitives under composition is absolutely essential to understanding what's going to happen in practice. And so when you look at what happens with this new kind of composition that we haven't really seen before, which is a, a competitive or a choice composition, we get some kind of a, um, a, a vector for introducing unfairness. So the theorem says that if you have two classification tasks, T and T prime, and they have not identical and non-trivial metrics, you know, this how similar should individuals be treated, uh, say D and D prime on a universe U of individuals, then there are individually fair classifiers, classifiers satisfying that Lipschitz condition, both for task T and for task T prime, that when you compose them naively, you will violate multiple task fairness. 
That is to say, there's a pair of individuals so that you'll get fairness on one of the tasks, but not on the other. When you look at the behavior of the system as a whole for individual U and for individual V. So if, you, if your system as a whole composes naively, we'll get fairness here for task T, but we won't get fairness here for task T. Uh, can somebody tell me how many minutes I have left? Three minutes. Three minutes. OK. Then I won't go. Um, the proof of this is actually very simple, but we're not going to go there. Um, there is a method of getting simple fair choice composition, which is the following. You can fix any probability distribution at all on the set of tasks. Then choose a task, an advertising task, according to that distribution, and only show ads for that task using a fair classifier. So that means that some people may not see ads, and you'll be leaving a lot of money on the table. So an interesting direction of research is how to leave less money on the table, but also stay fair. And I want to mention that while I've talked about composition properties for uh, in individual fairness, the same kinds of problems show up when you talk about group fairness as well. So for example, one group fairness notion says for sensitive attribute A, say race or gender, for a given classification level Z, you want that, on average, the, um, the, the, the probability of, let's say, getting admitted to the university, if you have this value of the sensitive attribute, should be the same as if you have that one. So here's an example where this would be the case. Uh, we get the same mean under single use, but it'll diverge under the OR of two. So we'll lose group fairness exactly the way we lost individual fairness. And something similar also happens for choice company. <coughs> Um, so I had here a couple of different sorts of remarks, and I clearly only have time for one of them. I'm going to go with this one. Um, think about fairness beyond classification. So I'm going to be represented in the future online by some kind of artificial intelligence. And for example, in my online negotiations or when they buy airline tickets or whatever. And this can be a source of great inequity too. So replace AI with lawyer. I'm represented by a lawyer. If I'm wealthy, I'm going to win over somebody who is represented by a less pricey and less accomplished lawyer. So I suspect that this is going to be exaggerated considerably in an online setting. That all of this unfairness is going to be happening really fast and really automatically and it's going to compound. So you know, how are we going to deal with this? Should, should these agents give each other some slack in order to compensate? I'm not sure. But I think that this is a very interesting direction of research. The basic definitions don't exist yet. Basic notions of composition don't exist yet, so I'll close here. Thank you. <laughs> the, the composition of results were joint with my student, Christina Alvento. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you so much.